know, I was very lost. I, I just had no idea what direction my life should, should go. So as any responsible human, I was like, I'm going to go to LA. And so when I moved to LA, uh, I knew one person and that person bought me an acting class for 25 bucks for my 21st birthday. And I went to acting class and I was like, I love this. <laughs> like it was the first thing that I had done, I think like in my life that I was just like, that I had such an immediate uh, connection to. Hey, I'm your host, Scott Sabloff. And with me uh, under that hat, because most people know him for great hair. It's Ross Butler. Great hair, man. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, my hair is kind of a mess right now. But, but uh, it's like, look, I don't have a lot to work with anymore. And look at that boy's hair. That's, that is uh, impressive. Man. Yeah, I got to get a haircut. You know, I'm shaving it off. I, I'm no. trying to look like you, Scott. No, no. <laughs> it's easier. But, but Ross, yeah. Ross Butler, actor, uh, musician. And, and I had firsthand when we met in person, we were in Switzerland yeah, and I was Krenz just Martin. absolutely blown away. We came back from a party and other people were just, you know, friend Charlie Day, Anthony Anderson. Yeah. And then you just sat down and like, yeah, I'm going to go to bed. And you sat down and you played the <laughs> piano for like an hour. Yeah, man. Uh, but you're great. Well, first you're, of all, you're really good. Life. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was so jet lagged. And after playing golf for two days, I was exhausted. But it's that feeling of like when you get into the zone and, and when you when you get into that that mindset, like you can't stop. I mean, you can. And, and eventually after two hours, we did stop. But yeah, I, I love doing that, man. I love just jamming with friends. That's like the thing about music is it just brings everybody and everybody's on the same page. And, and I, I just love that feeling. So once I get in there, I get in there. Well, you're a culinary person too. Same ex experience, right? Music, golf is like yeah. that too. <clears throat> you know, yeah. sports, because with sports, you're rooting together, you're doing things together. Yep. Right. Music and, and, and culinary because you gather, where do you gather when you're at someone's home in their kitchen? Yeah. Everybody stands yeah, and, around. And, uh, Wait, yeah. Me? Food, food too, man. I, it, that, that's always blown my mind. And I'm such a social eater. Like whenever I go out with friends, I, I love to, to pick like a really cool, interesting restaurant with weird stuff. And cause taste is such a specific thing. And it's like all of our other senses we, we can share, but like taste, you can never know if like you're, if you're experiencing the same taste as someone else. But, um, there is something just magical about like when everybody's tasting the same thing and, you're experiencing in your own way. That's it's such a bonding experience to me. I don't know. See, it feels very primal to me. Well, and, and you're right because it's it's subjective whether you like it. But if it's a cool spot and the food is really good, where they take pride in how they prepare it, it makes a huge mm -hmm. difference because then you you can feel as you're eating it. You know that you know. And then these chefs come over. They're checking on you. And I don't care if yeah. it's a a Michelin star or it could be at a strip mall and you just happen to know the right place. People take pride in what, what they give you and they want you to enjoy that food. So you're right. It's a, yeah. it's a very a basic lot. primal feeling where you could just relate to other people. So, yeah. you know, your background, uh, being born in, uh, in Singapore, correct? Yeah. Singapore. Yeah. Do you remember, uh, or have you spent time in Singapore? Um, I, I, I've been back twice since, uh, since my birth there. <laughs> um, so uh, the thing is my parents, they lived in Jakarta at the time in Indonesia, but they had me born in Singapore because the hospitals were better there. This was in the 90, in 1990. So, um, so I didn't really spend a lot of time in Singapore. It was more Jakarta for two years or four years. And then we moved to the States together. But yeah, I've been back to, to Singapore a couple times and, um, but not, I, I think the last time I went, I was 18. So it's been over 10 years since I've been there. Um, I don't want to go back. Uh, another big, great food city. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I want to go back again at some point, but yeah, I've only been back twice. For you, uh, you mentioned Jakarta. Would you mm -hmm. say you were raised in Jakarta or would you then cat or would you really say the U S in, in, in particular when you moved to Virginia? I, I, yeah, I, I'm, 
I was raised in America. Like Jakarta was, I, I have very like, I, I have quasi memories from Jakarta from like seeing photographs and being like, Oh yeah, I kind of remember something like that. But no, I, I was raised in America. I was raised in Virginia, right outside of DC. Um, yeah, th- there's no question about that. I'm like American completely through and through. What were your parents doing that you moved around like that? Uh, so my dad uh, worked for, for mobile oil. Like, uh, so my, my grandparents were, were, big in that and in he in indonesia he was the speechwriter for the prime minister of, of indonesia back in 90 um and then yeah when we moved to virginia um and he just did his own thing and uh th- they split up when i was younger too so my dad also lived in new york and my mom lived in virginia so i would go back and forth but um yeah yeah he used to be an expat in, in indonesia for you your childhood in virginia um mm-hmm. Do you have fond memories of, of Northern Virginia? Oh yeah. Northern Virginia. It's a great place to, to raise kids. Like that's what I'll say. And, um, the biggest reason a lot of people don't know this is in Northern Virginia. Um, they have the number one public school system in America, like right outside of DC. I think it's like, you know, the politicians made it up so that like all their kids can go to, to awesome schools for free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like my high school, um, it was like, I think it was like top 20 public high school in, in, in the country. And it was like going to a private school. Um, they're super strict. Like we didn't have to wear uniforms or anything, right? but it, like, education was crazy. Like I, I, I am very grateful for the education I got before, you know, I moved into acting. Um, but yeah, and it's a beautiful part of the country. Like the seasons there are awesome. Like, you know, spring and fall are amazing. The thing I love about that area, and I imagine for you growing up, a lot of cultures, because the nature mm-hmm. of DC and the politics yep. and all of the variables that go with that. So there's a lot of languages and, and also really good restaurants because there was like an international flair because it had to appeal to such a diversity of people. Yeah, no, where, where I grew up, it, it was, I, my high school was very diverse. Um, the, the thing though, is that, uh, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk maybe about this, like when we get to acting stuff later, but, um, it was so diverse to the point where I felt, uh, excluded from the diversity <laughs> because I'm mixed race and, and I'll explain this a little bit more. So there were enough, there was enough diversity where there would be pockets of these different ethnicities. So like, you would have Koreans and and like um, and the, the Filipino groups, and, and they would form their own cliques in high school, and they would you know speak their native language to each other to the point where, and, and you know, me being half Asian, I was like, oh, you know, I should probably be friends with these people, but no, like because <laughs> I wasn't full and, and I couldn't speak their language, so then, but then I also didn't fit in with the white kids, so I was like floating in between like these bubbles of of culture and not really a part of any of them. So you think that the diversity would have been good for me, but it actually like was too diverse to the point where I was never in anywhere. It, it did train you for your, your role in Shazam then, you know, as the adult yeah. version, right? Cause they had those kids yeah, yeah. Are, are yeah. all, all like kind of out of their pockets. Right. So it kind of, yeah. you're the grown up version of it. So perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just acting in general. When yeah. did you take up the piano? Uh, so my mom had me classically trained from, I think like eight okay. years on until I was like 16. Uh, so yeah, I was, I was classically trained and then, um, that was something my mom wanted me to do. So like, I, I think I drove my piano teacher insane <laughs> because I wasn't, uh, practicing as much. I started taking AG1 because I wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. I've been on it for about three weeks and I love it. For me, I work out every day. I have good energy, but wanted supplements to help my overall wellness. With one scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to start the day right. For me, that's a great pre-workout routine, great nutritional drink. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with the convenient daily nutrition. 
It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash path. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash path to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Athletic Greens. What sports did you play, if any? I was a tennis player. Okay. Big tennis player. Yeah. And that's another thing my mom forced me into. Um, and I played that from when I was like 10 till 18. Wow. Yeah. Or even earlier than that. Yeah. I was like, and most yeah, people, yeah, if you don't know this about Ross, he is six foot three and he is a full six yeah. three. Some guys say they're six three and they're really not. <laughs> You're tall six three. So I'm, I'm like six two and three quarters. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the shorter six two. So there, but, but for you, that height does help in tennis because it gives you some, some length. Yeah. Serve and volley all day. Yeah. For all the tennis players out there, you just serve, go straight to the net and just, I use that, that wingspan, my wingspan and my height. And yeah, that, that was my, my bread and butter when I was playing. Um, and I haven't played in a, I, I've played maybe 10 times in the last 10 years and I wish I kept up with it. And I'm thinking about, picking it back up, but my current obsession is golf. So I don't want to share my time. We're with good golf. with you doing golf. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, for, for you, you, you graduated high school. I'm, were you contemplating going to school to be closer to your folks in either Virginia or New York? You, you wound up at no. Ohio's, the Ohio state university, the Ohio state university. Yep. I, I went there. Um, study chemical and biomolecular engineering. And, uh, that's light. That's like light yeah. studies. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> just to show you how much I loved it, I dropped out a year later. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, did you enjoy the college experience when you went away? Right. I mean, you're here, you are in Virginia. It's quiet. You're going yeah. to one of the largest schools in the country <laughs> yeah. and like, their football program, right? I mean, to go mm -hmm. to the horseshoe and enjoy yeah. the experience of the Ohio State football, did you kind of meld into that or at all? Yeah, a, a little bit. So um, my dorm was Moral Tower, which is right outside the stadium. So if you went to like the top of our building during a game day, you could see down into the stadium, j just barely. Um, and it was nuts, man. Uh, yeah, and... and there was something interesting about joining this this huge mass of people, like at the, not the football game, the football game, but just the school and getting so lost and becoming like anonymous in this. Because again, like the high school I went to was big, but um, people knew each other and it was smaller and um, like the, the teachers really cared about you and put a lot of effort in. You go to Ohio State and there's like 150 people in a chemistry lecture. And it's just like, you're just part of this mass now. Um, and at first I was like, okay, this is kind of cool. I'm just kind of doing my own thing. And then, uh, and then it started to, to not feel great. <laughs> and, you know, maybe that's, you know, my acting narcissism coming out of it, seeing how young it, it started being, but I just felt um, kind of lonely in, in a weird way uh, ironic sense, it counter to what you would think. You'd think there's 50,000 people on this campus, but, um, but th that felt again, more, uh, isolating than, um, than unifying for me. Well, it could um, be intimidating for a lot of people, yeah. you know, if you're used to knowing a lot of people and, and coming from a, a smaller, more, like you said, intimate setting, being in a large lecture hall that has 500 students is just, you know, you're, you're just occupying time and it's what you make of it. So it could be, it could be challenging. So you leave o Ohio state, the Ohio state university, head back to Virginia, go to, yeah. uh, JC, uh, community college. Uh, no. So I, I, I did like one semester at, um, Nova, like, so Northern Virginia community college. Okay. And I made a switch again. You know, my mom thought it was a good idea to try computer science. Okay. Um, not for me. 
<laughs> not for me. Uh, yeah. And, and I did that for a while. I, I saved up some money. Um, yeah. And I was back home for a little under a year and then, uh, and then I moved to LA. So how did you get the acting bug? I mean, to move to LA, what, what was the impetus of that decision? Just to get out of Virginia. I, I, everything that I was trying, um, I hate it. Right. <laughs> there was nothing for me in Virginia. There's, I wasn't finding inspiration in anything I was doing. I, I was very lost. I, I just had no idea what direction my life should, should go. So as any responsible human, I was like, I'm going to go to LA, um, just move across the country where I didn't know anyone, move away from my family and friends. And uh, it was just kind of like a reset button with no vector. And uh, yeah. And so when I moved to LA, uh, I knew one person um, who a friend introduced me to. And, uh, and I just lived with them for a while. And that person bought me an acting class for 25 bucks for my 21st birthday. Um, and I went to acting class and I was like, I love this. <laughs> like it was the first thing that I had done. I think like in my life that I was just like, that I had such an immediate uh, connection to and it, it redefined the rest of my life. It was like this, it was a very strange uh, experience for me. And um, when I first got into it, I was apprehensive. I was just like, there's no way like I can turn this into a job. There's no Asian people in Hollywood. Uh, but yeah, so it, that was also intimidating, but in an invigorating way. Cause I was just like, Oh, I'm joining this completely new world. And, uh, but I'm excited and yeah. And here I am. You, uh, in your early success in acting were kind of, I would say like part of the Disney family, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, very, lack of very much terms. So. I mean, because they had so much yeah. going on from a content perspective at that window of time right place, right time. Mm -hmm. But how did you get yeah. noticed to get into that space? Cause it was pretty competitive. Um, I, I mean, I couldn't tell you, man, like, uh, so, so a big story I tell a lot is the first maybe three years of, or four years of me trying to act. Um, I didn't find much success. I was doing a lot of, uh, of student films. So, uh, and again, it's something that people don't know that much about me. I did student films, and like small commercials, non-union for like almost two years. So like I put in the work, like I was doing these student films to learn about being on set and learning film terminology from like USC students and UCLA students and, and also just being comfortable auditioning. So I did that for like, yeah, again, almost two years, like for little to no pay. I was getting paid in like goldfish crackers. Um, so like, that's what I was doing on the creative side of things. But then on the career side, like, I had agents and, and they were sending me out for very stereotypical Asian roles, like engineering nerd or like the martial artist guy. And I was like, this isn't me, man. Like, and nor do I want to portray this. So th there was like this one audition I went on and they wanted me to do like a heavy Asian accent. And I was just like, and I did it. And then after I just felt so like gross, I was like, this isn't, this is the type of content that when I was a kid made me feel different. Right. So I called my agent. So I was like, I'm not doing this, these auditions anymore. Don't send me out for these Asian stereotypical roles. I'm not going to do them. And they're like, okay. And I got a lot less auditions for a while. And this is kind of, I think when to answer your question, when it got discovered is um, I told my agent specifically, send me out for roles written for white guys. <laughs> and they're like, okay we'll do it. So finally I started getting into these audition rooms. The casting directors were starting to know me. So then they would start to request me. And then finally, you know, for these Disney shows, I did a Disney movie called teen beach movie, which is really small, but then also Casey undercover. Um, which was a big yeah, show. It, it, it was a bit, yeah, it was opposite Zendaya. This was like Zendaya's second big show. The first one was with Bella Thorne. Can't remember the name of it, but Casey undercover was like our first solo show. And the role that I auditioned for originally was cast as an African-American guy. But then they decided to recast. And I think I was the only Asian guy in the room. But because I had planted these seeds of not going out for stereotypical roles, these casting directors really didn't see me that way. So it was like two years of planting these seeds that finally came to fruition later 
where they're like, okay. And then I got cast opposite Zendaya and he was also mixed race. And um, from there I just started booking and yeah. And, and the Disney family, um, yeah, it was a great place to start. Like they teach you everything about um, PR and, and they like really put you through and it's great training for, that's why you see so many actresses and, and actors from the Disney camp really come out and they know how to handle themselves. And so now the, um, the, the question yeah. that I would ask is, you know, with the success of Disney, were you given free access to the theme park? Like, you go, Hey, I'm uh, on the Disney channel. So hence I can go to Disney. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, um, we, we did like a, like uh, some promotional stuff there. And it, they're like, if ever you want to come, just let us know and we'll give you like a guide and everything. So right. yeah, I unfortunately didn't get to take too much advantage of it because thankfully I was working, but uh, yeah, no, I, I wonder if they still allow me to, <laughs> to <go laughs> you should say that. I still have my Disney card. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. You, uh, at the same time you were still doing your music or were you not doing music at that time? Um, I don't, I, by doing music, like just playing. playing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, it was at that time actually that I started, uh, learning guitar. Okay. And the way that I learned guitar was actually through a commercial. So I did a commercial for this video game called, uh, Rocksmith, which is super cool game. It's you plug a real guitar into your Xbox and it's like guitar hero where you see the notes coming down, but you play it on a real guitar. Wow. And for the commercial, they were doing something called like the 60 day challenge or the 45 day challenge. And it's still on YouTube. You can look it up um, where you practice an hour a day or you play this game for an hour a day. And then at the end of this 45 days, they chose like the most improved. Um, and at, and guitar was another thing that I've been wanting to learn all my life. Cause it's a very much, a much more social instrument. Right. Um, so I was playing more than an hour a day. Like I was playing this game all day. And at the end of the 45 days, I was, I, I, I think I was like um, one of the most improved. And then they made a commercial of it, of my progress over 45 days. And uh, that's how I learned guitar. <laughs> and, that's sick. Um, that's an amazing yeah, story. Through, through acting. Huh? It's an amazing story because, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you just took to it. Yeah. And it, it was like a, it was a paid job. It, it wasn't me acting necessarily, but. Yeah. yeah, if you look up Rocksmith, like, 45-day challenge in, in my name, like, you, it's still up on YouTube. That's awesome. I, yeah. I will, you know, because to me, yeah. that's the fun part about yeah. the industry, you know, because certain little things like that can trigger you to really enjoy and have a passion, right? Uh, obviously, yeah. guitar, I mean, watching you play the piano, you obviously are passionate about it. So if you're playing the guitar the same way, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, I wish I was that good at, at guitar. I'm not, but I, I wish I was. It would be amazing. Um, you still learn. Yeah. For you, uh, you, you got on the, a big cast in Riverdale. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was a really good, uh, again, almost transition adult role, right? Um, you, you did other things, yeah, but- Team, yeah, but but you know, but not, what I mean? it's, it's kind of not looked at. You're not a little, you're not a little kid, you're kind of now yeah. in this space of you know, portraying, you know, because it may be a high school uh, setting, high school. But, but no, you yeah. know, it's like you know, that oh, that actor, she's you know, she's uh yeah. 26, but she's playing a high school student, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was literally me. I think I was 26 during Riverdale playing. Exactly. Playing, uh, I'm just saying, Leo. but, but now you're kind of getting into, but you're also into a role that people noticed you. There's a big cast, everyone, you know, really. The, the, the only thing I always wonder about those kinds of shows, do you have to vie for um, lines to, to try to feel like you're included or is that just not out of your control? It's, it's what your character is yeah. and you just have to it's, live with it it's kind of out of your control. Um, I would say, so with, you know, like the industry, you know, TV, they say is the writer's medium and you're, and it's because there's just so much content. Right. So it's like, uh, that you have to fill so much time. So it's, yeah, it's all up to the writers. And, um, for me, Riverdale. Yeah. I, I was like, uh, so th the timeline of things that happen helps explain this a lot. So 
we shot the pilot of Riverdale first, right? And, you know, in every TV show, you guys shoot a pilot, not every TV show, but back then you shot a pilot to prove, you know, that you right. should get a full season. So we shot the pilot of Riverdale and then we waited. In the time from the pilot or after the pilot, I booked another show called 13 Reasons Why, which was like the big Netflix show that we didn't need to shoot a pilot for. Like they got a full series order. And so that, you had the main role. Uh, again, yeah, identifying. One, one main, so, yeah, that was another ensemble cast. And, and a big um, cast, but you were the main lead versus Riverdale, right? I, I was a big, I was, yes, I was a bigger role in 13 Reasons than I was on Riverdale. Okay. Not the main lead, but I was, yeah, one of the, the main right. people. Uh, but again, the reason why I wasn't a bigger role on Riverdale is because I had to shoot 13 Reasons Why. And 13 Reasons Why and Riverdale shot, there was overlap. There was like a two month overlap. Oh, wow. Um, so shot the pilot of Riverdale, shot 13 Reasons Why season one. And then the last two months of 13 Reasons Why overlapped with the first with, with the first two months of Riverdale. So for two months, I was flying back and forth between San Francisco and Vancouver, shooting both shows. And then um, and I had to take a lesser role on Riverdale. And then we shot finished the first season. So um so because of 13 Reasons Why I had a smaller role on Riverdale and then I had to end up leaving Riverdale after the first season because 13 Reasons got picked up. So it was like this crazy time of, of uh, yeah, of like... Good problems. Good problems. But I, I, I was definitely fa- facing exhaustion because of the flying back and forth. Right. I was working like seven days a week for two months. So yeah, people, uh, Most good, people don't uh, you know, understand or can relate that to do two series like that, that are demanding and big casts, which requires, you know, multiple shots of every scene, you know, uh, that's a lot of grinding, a lot of, a lot of work on your part to try to be prepared for each character, which is different. The, the characters yeah. are dramatically different. So it's, it, it's a, it's a mindset. Um, yeah. the, the success of it is, is pretty obvious. If you had to give me a, an example and say, here's, here's a negative that comes with all of that notoriety. And then give me the conversely, you know, here, here's the best part about getting those roles. And then say, yeah. here's the worst part about getting those roles beyond the exhaustion. Yeah. Um, I, I would say the, one of the biggest things that affected me that I hadn't noticed until you know maybe the last couple of years um was the amount of time that you spend away uh can really affect you know y- your relationships with people like um either whether it's romantic relationships or, or or just friendships um because like to shoot a show like 13 reasons why it takes five months to shoot a show like riverdale one season takes 10 months and unless you have the people with you it's hard to maintain a lot of these relationships and, and a lot of time and a lot of effort is, is I wouldn't say sacrificed, but it's spent on, you know, shooting the show. Um, so with that in mind, the, the even bigger uh, downfall, like besides the relationships is this feeling of self-worth that you have. So Hollywood, the movie making business is an awesome glamorous business, but a lot of it as the actor, it's out of your control and you can feel, um, and I'll just speak for myself. I felt like I was sacrificing a lot of my relationships, a lot of my time, a lot of my effort to be in this, to, to, to have this amazing job. Um, and like I said, because you're the actor, a lot is out of your control. And I felt that I wasn't, uh, it isn't like a traditional job where the more, the, the more effort you put in the higher return you'll get. And this, it's a very strange nebulous, uh, formula and if there is one in Hollywood. So I was placing a lot of my self-worth on the things that I was in a career that I had very little control over. And I felt like I was sacrificing and putting so much into it and, and not getting what I deserve in return. Um, and, and, and I, like I said, that was, that was a reflection of myself of, um, since then I've changed my mindset where now it's like, this job allows me to do a lot of things in my real life. And like, you know, and, and since a lot of things are out of my control, I just enjoy my life as much as I can. And I try to make as much change as I can. But 
it, that would, that would be the negative for, for me a long time was, was placing way too much um, pressure on myself, um, you know, to, to gain achievement in a career that I didn't really have as much control over than I thought. And now um, give me the, the flip side, the, the positive beyond the financial independence that you could have, what mm-hmm. would you think would be a, like something that most people don't realize that's a really fun element of that kind of success? Um, it, it, kind of, it goes in hand with the financial, but it, I would say like this job allows me to uh, pursue any creative endeavors that I have in my life. And um, for me to be human is to be creative. Like creativity is, is the essence of being human. And I love doing everything that I can that is creative. Like that's either artistic or, 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 or just whatever. And cause they're all connected. So it allows me to get this broader scope of life where it's like the more things I learn, the more I see that everything is connected. And, and it gives me a very calming mindset of like, you know, um, a lot of the problems I used to think were big aren't as big any, uh, anymore. Uh, it, and it's a very philosophical thing, but it, it, it has broadened my perspectives on life and allowed me to be very, uh, be a lot happier, uh, but not in a way that people think. People think that, you know, if you get the financial freedom, you can buy whatever you want and you don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from, which is true. But it, it has given me a, a much, um, yeah, I know a lot of people aren't going to like this answer, but it's, it's given me a much, uh, I, I can't even describe it, it, it's, it's this feeling of one. It's such a spiritual, like philosophical thing. I almost don't even want to say it, but it, it's like the more things I've learned, the more at one with the world I feel and more at one with everyone else. I feel you're um, at peace. Yeah. At, at peace, but still hungry. Yeah. Well, what can we see you in, uh, uh, in, in the near future? Uh, so I got, I got three movies coming out in the next, I th- in, in the next five months. Okay. Um, so the, the big one is uh, Shazam 2. That's Shazam. coming out in March. My, my table is shaking. Shazam 2. Yeah. Yes, the uh, the sequel. And um, I can't talk much about it, but right. it's awesome. We we added Lucy Liu and Helen Mirren to the cast. So that was awesome. I got to meet them on the same day and oh, that was amazing. But yeah, that's coming out in March. Um, I have a movie that I was the lead in, uh, the romantic lead, and I also produced it called Love Boat Taipei, which is a, uh, we shot in Taiwan. Um, and it's a very Asian American story of like these Asian Americans that go back to Taiwan to learn about their culture over this summer school. And, um, and the main girl thinks it's going to be a drag. She's like, I don't want to learn about my culture. Like, this is going to be boring. But it turns out all these kids go back to the school program just to go out and party in, in Taipei. So it's like it, it, not something she expected. And it's these kids out on the town and then just and learning about their culture while also having fun and learning about themselves. Very awesome. I'm Asian American rom-com. Uh, and then I have an MMA movie coming out that I shot in Poland. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just like, it, it's a romantic drama mixed with an MMA movie. So it's like, we have these MMA fights and everything, but there's also a love story. Um, that's and it's, and it's a little dark. So now, did you uh, did you uh, like some serious MMA training for that? Oh yeah, I did. I think two two to three months of MMA training prior to shooting the movie. Um, yeah. Who and, was your coach yeah. for that? Was it like? In, in- uh, so I had a coach here in, in El Segundo, Daniel Lanero. So so Daniel uh, was my coach. And, uh, yeah, you trained me in, in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in boxing, kickboxing. We did some savat. Um, yeah. So, and I did that. Uh, that was a cool experience. Like I'd done martial arts in the past, but I'd never done uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, so yeah. And man, shooting an MMA movie is tough. <laughs> it is hard. I bet. Um, uh, yeah, man, like r- fights in real life. And I'm not, it's, I'm not going to say it's harder than fighting in real life cause it's not, but it's different. Uh, cause a, a fight, you know, in the ring goes on for 30 minutes at the max, uh, in when you're shooting an MMA movie, you're fighting every day for 12 hours a day, uh, on set. And it is, it is exhausting, man. It is, but very, very proud of it. Like, yeah, I cannot wait to see it. 
Oh, that um, sounds exciting. Yeah. I will share with you. I, I went to a uh, MMA, this is years ago. A friend of mine, he's a good instructor, has a gym in Manhattan Beach. My sister lives in Manhattan oh. Beach. So I'm, I'm staying there. I get up in the morning, go over and to work out. <laughs> and then he goes, yeah, just, you know, kind of work out with this guy here. And this guy was like five, five. Now I'm six, two, you're six, three, five, five, and maybe like 140. And I'm thinking, yeah. oh, come on, man. You can't pair me up with this little fella. And all of a sudden he doesn't share with me that this guy is on the U S Olympic team. Oh my God. So I, he goes, put your hands on my, uh, like, just put your hands right here. Hold my, like my collar right here. And I just, he flips me so fast. I'm yeah, like on man. the ground looking at him and, and I look over and I'm like the butt of all the jokes is everybody else in the class is laughing because they knew that guy was going to kick my ass. Yeah. Like, like yeah. super fast. Height, height is not a factor, not man. Like, the lower center of gravity you got, like you got to be careful with those and guys. leveraging. So, it was all about yeah. leveraging, and and yeah. he taught me. This guy was like so nice afterwards. He's like, "Are you okay?" I'm like, "Yeah, my humil, um, <laughs> yeah. humbled, immeasurably yeah. humbled." But, yeah, yeah, but it was it. So I can imagine filming that because you know mm -hmm. it's orchestrated, it's it's choreographed correctly. Yeah. But it's still tough. You you have to be in the yeah. right positions, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, stunt fighting and real fighting are two completely different skill sets, man. Like if you're actually fighting and you're punching like a like a like a pad, yeah. you have a pad to stop you, right? So you can put all your weight into hitting a pad and then retract. If you're stunt fighting, you have to punch, stop your own punch with, with a counter muscle and retract. Or if you're doing a hook, you have to go fully through it and retract. Like, so it's a two ways you're expending double the energy. Whereas again, in, in if you're fighting against pads or you're fighting someone, if you make contact, their body stops. Right. It. So, and it's absorbing it. And it's exactly. Yeah. And it, stunt fighting is man, it, it's rough. <laughs> it's like that. That's why all of us actors, I mean, I can't speak for all of us, but I have immense respect for this, for stunt guys. Like, cause there's, they're throwing their bodies on the line and they're so fit. Yeah. <laughs> they're all really so solid. Fit. Well, yeah. you know, we, we had a good chance to play a little golf last time we played. It was a bit warm Oof. and, uh, yeah. and so we don't want that. We'll have to, you know, reconnect, play some golf. It's cooler out. Enjoy it a little bit. Yeah. I thank you nice for, uh, for coming on the path here, sharing a little bit of your story and, and, uh, and letting people get to know a little bit more about you. Cause I, I found your, you know, the stuff when we, when we met in Switzerland, it was fascinating. Like every, everything you would say to me, it was like another layer of that onion. I'm like, you know, like, wow. You know, like I was, you know, biochem and I was like, like looking at you, you know, when you're talking about college education and it was just a fascinating so it was just mandatory to get you on the show and yeah, man, uh, just for to hear, me, like, yeah, man, just, just yeah. To, uh, as well, we get to visit, which is, which is even better. Yeah, man. No, it's always great catching up with you. And I was just talking to you because yeah, you've, you've done a lot of cool shit in your life too. So like being able to learn from you and to talk to, it's been, it's great. I can't wait to, to golf with you again. Sounds awesome. Good seeing you, Ross. Yeah, man. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this week's show. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Feel free to write us on thepathhere.com to have one of your questions featured on a future episode. You can follow me on Instagram at Scott Savlo. If you want to send us a tweet or follow us on Instagram, it's at the Path Here Podcast. Hey, I'm Scott Savlo, and you've been listening to The Path Here.